Welcome to the Derek Diamond Experience Podcast, where every week I take a look inside the world of film and television with those who have lived it and experienced it. I am your host, Derek Diamond. Coming up on today's show, you'll be hearing my conversation with writer-director Stephen M. Smith, as well as actors Tony Fadiel and Elliot Cable. They join the show to talk about their latest film, Dead Again, which if you're a fan of Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, you will enjoy this movie quite a bit. I had a blast watching it, and I had even more of a blast talking with the three gentlemen that were so crucial in making this movie happen. But first, I wanted to talk about uh, an anniversary that happened uh, late last week, and I know it's been talked about ad nauseum uh, over the news, the show, and most podcasts, really all podcasts, have had to mention it at some point. But that is the one-year anniversary of COVID-19, and specifically when it shut the film industry down. It was actually on March 12th that the executive producers of Grey's Anatomy said that out of an abundance of caution that they will be shutting down production effective immediately. And within the next 24 hours, virtually all productions had shut down. And really the world shut down because at the time we had no idea what this virus was, what it was capable of. You had heard rumblings of it happening overseas. And I remember attending Pensacon uh, in late February last year thinking, you know, is this going to come to the United States? And who knew that just a few weeks later, things would be shutting down. Movie theaters had shut down. I remember you know, going to see Sonic the Hedgehog on opening night. And looking back on it, that was one of the last big releases of the year. Uh, Onward came out, uh, the Disney Pixar film, in early March, and then two weeks later, it was out because theaters were done. They were shut down, and it was available on Disney+. Plus. And I remember that was unheard of when that happened. And since then, other studios have, have adapted to that. You know, with Warner Brothers, all their latest releases, in addition to being in theaters, are now on HBO Max for a month. And I've you know, taken advantage of that, and I'll be doing it more this year because it's something that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon, if ever, because there are going to be some people that even when you know COVID is essentially over as we know it, there are still going to be people that are very leery about going out unless they absolutely have to. And I, I think movie theaters specifically... Um, I don't think movie theaters will ever be the same. I think movie theaters will survive, but I think the, maybe I should say it this way. I think movie theaters will survive and we will still get the movie theater experience. But I think the days of having several big budget blockbusters a year very well could be over. I know there are some that are in the can like Black Widow no Time to Die that haven't been released yet, but they'll be more of a big deal. Like the Marvel films will still have that big epic, you know, like big budget feel. But I think we're going to get a lot more of the smaller budget indie movies, which I'm okay with because I enjoy those stories more, if I'm being perfectly honest. And I, I think even Star Wars you look at the success of The Mandalorian and how popular it's been. Like It was so much better received than the new batch of movies that came out. I think with Star Wars, the, the streaming aspect and the, the series aspect of it is what Star Wars needs to do long term. And we've seen it with WandaVision, with Marvel and soon to be Falcon and Winter Soldier. People really love the the sheer amount of content you get from series, whether it's binging like a Cobra Kai or something you have to watch weekly like the Mandalorian or WandaVision. And I, I think it really depends on what that medium actually is or what series it is. Cause like Cobra Kai, that show I want to binge all in, you know, a day or a couple of days because they're the series is 10 episodes each are about half an hour. So I, with that, I'm, I'm good with having it be bingeable. But with WandaVision, I really liked the weekly aspect of it because it built on the anticipation. And it, it kind of reminded me of Lost you know, back when it was in its heyday years ago 
when the new episode of Lost would come out, the next day you'd be talking with everyone at school or work, like, you know, can you believe what happened? Yeah, I can't wait to see what happens next. The same thing happened with WandaVision. And I, I love that. A lot of people don't because I think binging has spoiled people when it comes to digesting content. Everyone wants everything now, but it doesn't have to always be that way. But kind of going back to what I was saying about COVID and it's you know affected everyone in different ways and it's affected me in both positive and negative ways. The positive is you know, I got to do something different with my job. And I, I worked remotely uh, for, I'd say, about half the year before we went back into the office. But I got to do different things besides working baseball. I got to expand my skills as a videographer that I wouldn't have done, you know, had COVID not happened and we would have just had a normal baseball season. And the most important thing is, is that I reconnected with Samantha, who I'm now engaged to be married to. I don't know if that would have happened had COVID not you know, been prevalent in the world. You know, we wouldn't have had to change what we did at work because we, we, you know, still would have had baseball. But the fact that we didn't and we're doing trivia nights, you know, and, and then that led to Samantha coming to those and then we reconnected and now we're engaged to be married. So it, you can... You can really look at it in different ways. You can yeah, think of it as the negative. And I know a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of businesses had to shut down. But I, I think you know, there's a saying that I like to live by, and that is life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And there have been some positive things that have come out of COVID. I think the increased awareness of mental health uh, has become very relevant when it comes to COVID because it has been very traumatic for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people lost their livelihoods. They've lost friends and family members due to the virus. So I, I think you can, you can take away with it, you know, what you will. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm downplaying any of the negative because I know there's certainly that, but um, it's been a very learning year uh, for yours truly. I know I, I personally, I wanted to try and make another short in 2020. That didn't happen. Hope to do that later on this year. But there's been positive and negative uh, aspects of it. But before we get to the interview portion of the show, I wanted to to kind of look back on what some of my former guests have said about COVID. And it was interesting going back and listening to these because there are a couple that, you know, the interviews took place right after the pandemic really started to to take the country, you know, by storm. And then hearing the more recent comments it has been interesting to hear the the comparisons between the two. So I, I have five different clips that I'll be playing before uh, I come back with um, the lead into the interview. But uh, you'll be hearing from former guests, Honey Lauren, Ryan Brookhart, Ben Recky, Christina Wren, and Christopher Duke. So here are their thoughts on the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's affected their career. It is shut down, for sure shut down. I have some things that are supposed were supposed to happen at the end of April in terms of work and prior in the last couple of weeks, maybe maybe about three weeks ago, I was going out on auditions and it felt very ambivalent. And I was like, this doesn't feel like it's gonna happen because things were starting to creep in. And sure enough, Things got canceled, everything, commercials, television shows, films, everything's been canceled right now. Uh, there was some crazy casting call out today saying, hi, make a video of yourself um, taking uh, during the quarantine, how you would have a party. I'm thinking by yourself, what are they trying to ask us to do? But I mean, that's the kind of stuff they're casting now. Really crazy. So uh, nothing is happening here in terms of that. We all have to be really you just hold on and try and get through this. Yeah, so complete shutdown. Because of that, I believe we have a tremendous opportunity to to do a, a lot of great stuff. I mean, there's going to be a lot of, you know, not great stuff too, but I think that it is a tremendous opportunity. And yeah, to your point specifically, look, I've been working out of my own home office for years. Uh, the idea of having an art department, um, an actual existing art department in a studio, I think that went away years ago. I think one of the last ones if I'm not mistaken, was uh, on the Paramount lot. And that ended uh, right after a specific film. There was, there was 
you know, everything was being outsourced. And I feel, you know, it's a very strange thing because definitely all the designers I know, we're making a lot less money than we did when we had, you know, studio projects on a regular basis. Now there are so many things out there and the price has gotten lower in part because the perception is, well, if it's not being printed, uh, then it's, you know, it shouldn't cost as much, which is, which is up, you know, totally ridiculous because it's still the same material, if not more material. You know, every piece of art you do, you're doing multiple versions of that piece of art. And that doesn't include all the different, you know, comps, you know, versions you're doing. So it's, it's A, it's got to be something you love to do. You know, B, you've got to have a real hunger to make it really, really good. And C, there is a tremendous opportunity for this kind of work, whatever the, you know, whatever the work is in terms of making films, making content because we're going to need more and more and more of it. And like you said, dude, I mean, we're never going to go back to the th way things were. I, I truly believe that the cinema experience will return. I believe the theater experience will return, but it will not be the same experience. And I think it's going to be a slow road back to some, some degree of what we remember, but not, again, not the way we remember it as kids. Um, it will never be that freewheeling. I just don't think it will be. Well, it's, you know, it's affected everyone in different ways in every industry in catastrophic ways. It's uh, disrupted our way of life. I mean, you know, personally, I actually had COVID back in January. Um, there was a, a first wave that came to this country. It came through uh, Los Angeles in November, December, and January. And um, they estimated that about a half a million Angelinos had it at that time. And so I thought it was a pretty bad flu. Um, and didn't, you know, I went to the doctor and, and was pretty knocked flat for a while, but recovered. And when the antibody tests came out in March, I went and took one and, and they were like, yeah, you, you have the antibodies. So you, were you sick recently? And, and so, um, you know, I, in some ways I feel like glad that I've had it and maybe have like a certain amount of immunity to it for a certain amount of time. Um, but as far as how it's affected work, uh, you know, Fortunately, I was in post-production on my next film on a, on a documentary. And so um, we were had the opportunity to continue editing and, and doing like sound work and just finished that film um, recently. And so I think people that, you know, were in post-production or are in development are able to continue work. But, you know, obviously production is is still shut down for the most part. And so we'll see a lull in, in new releases and new TV shows. Um, and it's been tough. I mean, I think documentaries will pick back up sooner than fictional films, just because of, you know, you can do a smaller crew and it's non-union a lot of the time. Um, but, you know, how and what this like landscape will look like moving forward, we're all still trying to figure out. One of my last experiences, really the last thing I did before going into lockdown, one of my dear friends was in um, the Harry Potter show in San Francisco, and she was um, had a big show coming up where she was playing one of the lead roles because she she like understudies a handful of the main characters, so she's going to go on as a lead. So I was like, well, great, like I'll drive up and see you. I was in LA, and all this stuff started happening, and we were sort of going like, is this okay? Can we still go? And I remember having this feeling of get it in now. Like you can see it's not quite here yet, but it's, it's coming and everyone was sort of chatting about it and hoping we were okay and doing the right things. We still didn't quite know what this thing was and where it was going, but in hindsight, it's so strange to think about now. Like I cannot, I'm so grateful. Number one, that I got to see it and have that experience before all this, but also like, I can't even hardly remember being in a room with five people, much less a giant theater. You know, it's just like, to your point, a completely different world. It just feels like another existence. I was on a production in uh, March that uh, I was uh, uh, stunt coordinating and, and uh, working with a director I'd worked with for years. And we were supposed to have, you know, two and a half days to do this this big scene, this ending of this movie, uh, big fight sequence, and you know, three of the four people die, and it's this whole big thing. And the producer said, "Yeah, you have two and a half days, you know, to do this." Okay, great. 
So we did our half day. And then when we came to the first full day, you know, the producer comes up, he says, Hey, you know, Chris, uh, if you had to, could you do it all today? And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, I know you have two, you said two days, but could you do it all today? And I'm thinking, uh, are you going to shut us down? He's like, no, 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 no. But could you do it all today? And I said, well, if we go all night, you know, until the sun comes up, you know, I, I think so. He's like, okay, well, let's give it a shot. And so we barreled through all night and literally right before the sun came up, we got the last shot in. And then sure enough, you know, big, big money guy producer comes on set and says, uh, we were in New York at the time. And he says, you know, on the advice of our lawyers in the state of New York, uh, we are going to go ahead and shut down you know, uh, this, this film. Like, oh, you know, everybody get back, you know, safe as you can. Okay. So, you know, the airlines were letting you back then, they were letting you change, you know, your flight with no uh, penalties or whatever. And it was the most surreal thing. I was at JFK and you have to take these big buses, you know, to go to your, your, uh, you know, your, your, your area. And normally those buses are just packed wall to wall. And I have a picture somewhere on my Facebook where it's myself and the driver literally the only people on the bus and he's like well sir you ready to go i go sure you know and you know flew home and uh really was just kind of had nothing for a few months until you know as you know we kind of got our heads wrapped around you know what is this you know how is this going to affect where is it going is you know summer's coming is it is it not as bad you know what's going on and so you know, the first production, the first couple of productions that came back that I did a couple of independent things, you know, it's this whole new world. You know, we got our, got our mask on. Okay. Well, now I'm on set, uh, but I got to run over to craft service. Right. Do I have to go get it and put it on and cause I'm running offset, but then I'm coming back. And, and then the makeup gals like, well, don't put it back on cause you're gonna mess up your makeup. Okay. And uh, uh. so, you know, there's all these new, you know, sort of parameters that we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, to say it's had an effect uh, on my career is certainly an understatement. Um, you know, I've still been working, thank God. I've still had, you know, some, some nice gigs uh, this year and some really good auditions uh, that have come across, you know, my desk. Um, it's just different, you know, I, I'm, I'm a realist. You know, I believe, you know, we, we adapt to what we're given in life. And uh, this, is, this is where we are right now. So it certainly has been uh, new. I, I don't think it's been you know, something for me, I can't adapt to, you know, my career has continued on and, and I think we'll continue on certainly under new rules. Uh, those rules do seem to change, <laughs> uh, you know, from time to time, depending on where we are, but yeah, it's definitely been a new, uh, what's the term, uh, a new normal. Hopefully you guys enjoyed hearing those sound bites from previous guests. Uh, it's been interesting to hear uh, different stories and how people have dealt with COVID and how it's affected their career and the adjustments that they've made to it. But on to a lighter note, uh, this week on the show, I'll be chatting with three awesome individuals who work in the film industry, writer-director Stephen M. Smith and actors Tony Fadiel and Elliot Cable. They were a part of a really fun film that I got to watch called Dead Again. It's made in the same light of uh, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. So if you enjoy those movies, you'll definitely want to check out dead again. But what I loved about this conversation was the passion that these three individuals have for this movie and working in the film industry in general. And it's conversations like this that really remind me that this is the world that I want to be in. This is the world that I want to be a part of. And it's, it's really inspiring hearing how much they enjoyed making this film. And they made it in a very short amount of time that you'll hear about in the interview, but the fact that they were able to do it and do it successfully and have fun doing it was, was great to hear. And hopefully you guys enjoy hearing this conversation as much as I had doing it. So here is my chat with Stephen M. Smith, Tony Fadiel, and Elliot Cable. Welcome back to the Derek Diamond Experience podcast. And this week I'm talking about a film that I watched very recently and very much enjoyed. I'm really excited to talk about it. It's a horror comedy called Dead Again. And I have three guests from the film. First up, we have the writer director, Mr. Stephen M. Smith. Stephen, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing, Derek? 
doing fantastic. We've been having a, a blast talking before we started recording. So I'm, I'm excited to, to dive into this conversation, but also joining us, uh, two of the actors from the film. First up, we have Tony Fadil. How are you? I'm very well. Living the dream, living the dream. <laughs> you got to. You, you got to. And also joining us is actor Elliot Cable. Elliot, how are you, sir? Doing very well. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. No, we've been we've been having a blast talking. So we I, I just wanted to to dive right in with this film because there are certain films that you watch and you just get the vibe that it was so much fun to make. Like I had fun watching this movie because I could tell that you were all having fun doing it. So, uh, Stephen, let's start with you. Uh, what was the inspiration uh, behind making this film a reality and how did you come up with a story for it? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a real big fan of, of Edgar Wright and Sean Pe um, and, and so, uh, Simon Pegg and um, Nick Frost's trilogy. And obviously, from my perspective, I've always wanted to just go and make those kind of movies. They're the kind of movies that really are fun to do. And if you're going to have a movie and you go, well, I've got no money, I've got four days, but at least we're going to have fun. Then I just sat down and I wrote the script in two days and and I sent it to these guys and said, this is just for you, because I really kind of wrote it for both of them, um, with both of them in mind, because thinking, well, this will work perfectly. Um, and then, of course, you, you, look, you, look at, you look at the, obviously, you've got a very uh, non-existent budget. So you have to think about how you push the story along um, with practically nothing, <laughs> nothing behind you. <laughs> like, so I think um, it's just inspiration from, from everybody else that suddenly got on board and they said, well, we can do this and we can do that. And then the place I was shooting at, I knew what I was doing, where it was. And you just ended up bang, 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 bang with the shots. And you end up getting something that you know in the can, you're going, oh, this is really good because everybody's spot on with what they're supposed to be doing and i can't really remember us taking doing many takes on each thing it was kind of like we did a couple there's a, there's a small very small blooper reel but yeah everybody was bang on there's a couple of really funny things in the bloopers that were, that were, were hilarious um and i think these guys and and everybody involved you know it's it's not just about me it's them they've 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 brought things to life I write the characters and go, well, actually, you know, I, if I could have Bobby De Niro and I could have whoever in my film, but I don't. I, I write it with people who can still are still great actors who can pull it off. And without their performances, especially from um, Elliot and Tony, you know, you, you're not going to pull it off, but you, they're believable and you like them. From the first moment, you like them, even though Tony's character is a bit old-fashioned, old-school, you like him. And Elliot's character is like, well, you shouldn't be doing it this way, but you still like him, you feel for him. And that's why it works, because you want them to succeed. So I won't give away what happens at the end, but you want, it to, you want them to succeed. So that's really it. And I think when we were shooting, uh, hoping that we all had the same feeling, which was that actually this is good, and that's why everyone really you know, push, put in 150% and we've ended up with what we've got, which is a fun film, I think. Fun and, and, and silly <laughs> and crazy and, yeah. Well, and you, you brought up a great point when you mentioned that with the film, it's not just about you, it's about everyone. And it's a great feeling when you have a cast and crew kind of buy in as much as you do because when they're motivated it motivates you as well so i'm sure that had to be a great feeling seeing that the cast and crew were just as into it as you were it the, the inspiration for me is when i see people enjoying themselves as much off camera as they are on camera uh but still doing their job and still being professional and that really is the best environment you can have on film sets and I know I've worked with Tony on, on quite a few things and I've worked with Elliot on another film and you, we, we know there are films that you'll be on and, the, and it is stressful. Filmmaking isn't easy. People think it is, but it isn't easy. And I think you've got to, you've got to go into this with the approach, which is the positivity that they gave. And I think if these two guys were sitting in the van with me on the trip down and they were all quiet, but they weren't, they were excited about everything, <laughs> then I might have been worried, but I was really super excited. So really, it's them that really helped me to motivate me to, to go, well, this is going to be good. Um, 
And, you know, if we'd had eight days, I imagine what the film would have been like, you know, it would have been even better. That's fantastic. I'm curious, and we'll start with you, Tony. What was your initial thought when you got the script and you kind of realized what a fun movie this could be? Oh, I loved it. It was it was incredible. It was incredible to read. It, it had me laughing from the beginning. I mean, um, a lot of Steve's writing when he does is is um, it, it's very easy to follow Steve's script. Sometimes I get scripts from from my agent and, and I read them, and it takes me quite a while for them to sink in to understand what's going on with Steve's stuff. He writes it as it is, um, as he sees it, and he and he's he's quite we're quite lucky with him really because like he says, I've done a lot of films with him, and Steve sort of lets me go off on a whim with your creative side of things. You know what I mean? He lets you, he lets you bring on your own changes, bring your own thing to it. Um, he steps in if he needs to, but he, he, he gives you plenty of freedom to work. And I, and I like that. I like to have the freedom to be able to, to, to bring what you can to camera if it's going to work. Um, but, but like I say, I mean, I, I, I generally find if I read a script and I can see myself really playing that part, I know that it's written really that well. Do you know what I mean? It's written and, and it suits me. Um, I'm not an actor that takes on everything sometimes i read things that i've been given an opportunity to, to and, and i'm very grateful i'm given the opportunities to to take part in them but they don't suit me they I don't fit they don't feel right and i, and I just won't do them there's just no point it's you know it's, it's it's got to feel right it's got to fit right and like i say with, with steve stuff from the beginning when i read the script the first time around i could see myself playing it i could see how funny it was going to be how how, how, how we could bring it up and make it even funnier with the right chemistry and the right bouncing backwards and forwards with the right characters. And like I said, I'd never worked with, with Elliot before. It was the first time I'd worked with him. So it was, uh, it was a new challenge there for, for, to work with another actor on this sort of thing and see what level we could take it to. That's fantastic. What about you, Elliot? It was, you know, it was, it was really interesting. Um, so as Tony and Stephen have said, we, uh, prior to Dead Again, I hadn't worked with either of these guys. And um, I remember sort of getting a phone call from Stephen and him basically just being like, I've got this role for you that I, uh, you know, I've seen you played a, a policeman in something else and um, I think you'd be perfect for it. And that, that for me was really novel. That was the first time I'd ever been approached for a role by someone saying, I've seen you do this and it's, it's this, but we can take it further. Um, and likewise, similar to Tony, he, he sent me the script. I remember reading it and being like, that, that is, that's really, really funny. Um, I remember reading it through with my girlfriend and um, being a little bit uh, worried because when I when I first read it, I knew who PC Brody was, and I was like, I did a lot of character work on, him, but I knew I knew where we were kind of coming from. But I worried that with Sean Cooper, I was like, I don't know who's playing that character, I don't know how that's going to work. And I think Tony called me about two days later, and we just had this conversation about. It. And immediately, I was like, that's yeah, this is we're going to be fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, um, I was really, after that conversation, I was really excited to, to crack into it with, with Tony. Um, and like you said, Stephen gave us so much freedom. And I think because it was such a good script and it was a funny script and it was a tight script, we learned it. And as we said, in the van down, we were just sort of cracking off the line. And then when we got to set, while Steve could worry about sort of camera and shots and whatever else, it just let me and Tony kind of just go off and, um, he was really happy to let us just do what we wanted to do. And it was, yeah, it was a really brilliant all round experience. Was, I, I remember coming into it really, really excited. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, and as I mentioned before, you know, the, what I liked about the movie is that it moved at a very good pace. Like to me, everything moved the story in some form of fashion, you know, you build up the the chemistry between you two, which I loved, you know, we were talking off air that, you know, with all the pop culture references, I felt like I felt like I was Cooper saying all these references to like, you know, Jaws or Back to the Future. And all my younger friends are like, oh, you mean that really old movie? And I'm like, please don't say that. <laughs> please, please do not say that. <laughs> so. So, yeah, it, it it was really, really fun watching the relationship between Cooper and Brody grow and you learn a little bit more about them you know, every scene that you see, like it cuts to other characters and it comes back to them and you learn a little bit more about Cooper's story or Brody's story. And then, you know, not to spoil anything, but, you know, when the when things take a turn for the worst, you know, that that chemistry and that camaraderie is there, which was which was really fun to watch. You know, watch the progression of those two characters was was really cool. I, but I've got to ask, how did you guys film this whole thing in four days? 
Because that sounds insane. That was, well, um, four, it, was originally, it, was, it was originally three days. <laughs> three the guys? first day, the, it was three. It was three days. So we were filming actually two movies, guys. Remember, we were shooting two movies together, and yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a crazy because uh, I mean, years ago, one of the first things I ever did as a as a teenager was I managed to get on the set of a TV series called Lovejoy, and. I got to know a few of the people and then I uh, one one moment Ian McShane actually had a chat with me about stuff because I was I was very young and he just said you know he I think he was a Manchester United supporter and, and, and my stepdad was a Manchester United supporter we chatted and then a couple of years later a few years later I wrote a script which was a follow-up to a love love joy and they kind of took it seriously and Sky were talking about maybe doing these two-hour episodes it never came to fruition but Ian McShane read my script, which was called Up the Hudson. It was actually set in New York, um, and it was set a few years on from the story. And he said to me that if you don't need fillers, don't have them. If you can get from point A to point C without B using dialogue or action, you don't need it. A lot of things have these fillers. Now, you talk about runtime. There are two reasons for that. One is I specifically wrote that with in in my mind, you could go from scene A to scene C without having to have this filler. Um, the other reason is obviously we had three or four days to shoot the movie, so you have a lot of filler that we've had to put in from different things with the spaceship and you've got you know Trump and all that at the beginning. But that's all to do with the virus, and I've obviously borrowed stuff from the lockdown. Um, but it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot that. You know, a lot of my scripts get co-written because the way things are funded, they want the, the, the people who are funded and want certain things in them. This was funded purely by me and one other person who said, you can do what you want. So that's when, when we get to set, you know, these guys, I don't really need to direct them very much because I know that they're going to go off and they're going to come back with something that works. Brody... And, and Cooper, their characters are, sh- are so straightforward. One doesn't care for about anything in the world and lives in a place where nothing happens. So it's like you go into an indigenous m- a tribe in the middle of nowhere. Well, they ain't going to know about all the complications that are going on. And then you've got the other character who has been brought up through the system, does everything by the book. So it's pretty simple, really. One person's going to go, what's the problem? The other person is going to go, this is the problem. The other person is going to say, this is not a problem. You know, so it's kind of like a, it's an old comedy act, old Laura and Hardy. It's a, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's one is the straight man and one's not. Uh, but put, then put them into a position where, wait a minute, one story arc can go the other way and the other one can go the other way. So you have this guy who didn't care about anything and suddenly does care about something which is saving the world. And then you've got the guy who follows the book, decides not to follow the book to save the world. So that was really the premise. And again, without these guys and without all the other actors and all the other elements, the makeup, the the sound, the the location, you know, we would never have been able to pull it off. Um, We were given so much freedom at the location, weren't we guys? Literally we could do what we wanted. And this, this place, I mean, I know I've got to know him really well. Um, but there, you know, there are some locations that go, "Why well, you going to be out the door at this time?" And, and we didn't ever feel rushed. I don't think we ever felt rushed filming this, did we? We no, they were really, it, really accommodating for, for everything we wanted to do. Yeah, um, yeah, they were brilliant. Hmm. I mean, I so can still remember. It. I could still remember when Steve first said to me about. I mean, I got the script, I read it, I thought, "Yeah, this is great, it's really good." I didn't know about the time scale that we had. I never knew that till the <laughs> last minute about how long we had to film it. That I didn't know. And I remember him telling me a few days prior to us going down there. And I thought, geez, I'm not sure. <laughs> how are we going to pull this one off? So I remember saying to you about the accommodation. That's how me and Elliot ended up together. Because I said to Steve, look, you know, I need to be in with him. You need to find somewhere where I can stay with him. And we need to run and run this. Because the first take that we did was 15 pages back to back, straight through. And we had to yeah. nail it on the note. So when you see us, first of all, uh, and I do the shark gags at the beginning and we do that long walk and that conversation. We come right the way around. It's all done in a tape. Do you know what I mean? It had to be remembered. But, that, but that's what, that <laughs> yeah. was the, the, but that was the plan. It was designed that way. It was designed to have one day of madness with all zombies and creatures and everything else. 
And the other two, three days were these long scenes where you basically just develop the characters with the dialogue, show them the location and, and get the feel that this, this place is pretty quiet and desolate. And, and these guys are funny. They are funny people. Um, and he's a funny guy, as they say. I did want to put a bit of God, Goodfellas in it at some point. I wanted you to do the good. That was instead of doing uh, the thing about Dirty Harry, I wanted you to call, call him your funny guy. I wanted you to say, Elliot, to say, you're a funny guy. And what funny guy? And just do the old Goodfellas. <laughs> funny how. But I, I, I didn't think I'd get away with it too much. But maybe, maybe in the sequel. <laughs> there you go. Did it again too. <laughs> yeah, I'd hear first, alive. guys. I'd hear first. Dead again, dead again. Still alive. <laughs> still alive. <laughs> dead again, dead. Still alive. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. No, well, it's, it, you'd say what happens next. They run off. We won't know. We won't give away yeah. what happens next. Well, and I, I love movies that do that too, that leave it kind of open to interpretation where, like, you could make a sequel and you can also theorize on you know, what's going to happen with these two characters next. It's like that old, that old saying, you know, always leave the audience wanting a little bit more. And I, yeah. I thought that ending, I thought that ending did that well. Cause it was just like, wait, what, what happens? Like they, they, exactly. they run off but and like, what, what, what were they doing? But the fact that you're saying what happens, we, we've got you. And I, yeah. I think I remember seeing Spielberg being interviewed and saying, if you can get them in the first four or five minutes, or it's Hitchcock or someone like that. So if you can get the audience in the first four or five minutes, you've gone for the rest of the film. So if you believe in these characters, by the end, you're going to go, well, well where have they gone? It's the same as a soap. It's very much like a soap opera. You're, you're, you're basically following these characters. But then this madness happens, you know? So um, days of our lives, but then there's an apocalypse. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, love, I love the full circle. I'll tell you what got me, the full circle of it all, the actual starting of it with the, you know, we're going to need a bigger boat. And then our two characters at the end, when he says to me, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> so Come on, everybody's seen Jaws. Everybody's seen Jaws. So that's the thing. But he's so kind of like, no, I haven't seen it. What are you talking about? <laughs> it was just the look between us both when we're standing on that step. It was but what so you've got to remember... I think what you got to remember, the thing that comes out of this is that if you think about it, it's his first day at work. Yeah. And it's your last day at work. And that really was the premise. And yeah. if it's your first day at work and you're at work, you're not really going to question anything. You're going to just go along with everything someone says. So it's only right at the end when you're on the precedent of the end of the world, he's going to say, well, yeah. actually, <laughs> you yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something else I'm curious about, too, is you know, we've talked about, you know, how much fun it was to make the film. There had to be some fun on set moments or maybe something like really crazy that happened. So, uh, Tony, we'll start with you. What is one funny or just crazy on set story that stood out to you? On set story? Oh, I don't know. There was there was there was so many. There were so many really funny faces. I mean, some of the bits that I really loved was the. The, the, it was the, the, the sort of ad-libbed Marx Brothers bit that me and Elliot do when we come running out of the room and he goes to run off and I pull him back and then he goes to go again <laughs> and we're trying to communicate with each other and there was there was loads of them and there was, a, there was another one that really stands out with, with Mark when me and Mark were coming down the stairs and I've asked him to give me the gun and I say, look, stay behind me. And the next thing I know, and it literally was genuine. I went to turn around and it was right up behind me, literally. And I turned around and said, I'm not that close. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, there was so many unscripted bits, which was great. Mm. <laughs> there was so many great moments like that for me. They really was. But like, like Steve said, you know, it was, um, I think it was a it was a great chemistry, a really great chemistry. And like Elliot said earlier, and I've never worked with him before. It's really hard to do it comedy when you don't know someone, especially with stuff like that, because it's it's the timing that has to be right. If you don't know what each other's chemistry is like, and I think me and Elliot were really lucky because our chemistry was really good from the very beginning. When I met him, his energy levels were like mine; they were high. He's quite hyper, like I am. Um, so our chemistry was really, really good straight away, and the bounce that we had was phenomenal. So it's hard to pinpoint one for me. There was just there was loads. There was, you know, about walking down the town, Elliot, like, when we'd done the bit with when we were filming through the town. And I was actually I was actually waving to people in their windows because I wasn't sure. Though. Yeah, right, we had we, we, left it. we, left we had really we legit. Left yeah, because we had such legit um police gear on and and people every time we'd sort of get out of a car to film, people it was such a quiet town, but whenever anyone went past, they'd always be like, 
oh my god, there's, there's two policemen walking around well, the you, town, and we'd just be like, you two, oh. you two, you 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 two, your accommodation was at the other end of the property that we were f- uh, filming at. So this hmm. is a massive mansion with grounds that's all derelict, virtually derelict. But there's a church. If you walk beyond that, that's the church where is Paltimore, which is the name of the village and the name of the house. So your property was actually in the village. So in theory, you guys could have walked down every day. And then the locals might have thought, oh, we've got, we've got really good police service. <laughs> around here. Yeah. Every day they yeah. come down, morning and night. <laughs> yeah. so I was right. thinking about, um, when you talk about uh, good set stories, I was thinking about when we had to deal with the, the barricade. The scene oh, where God, we had, yeah. to barricade on, <laughs> had to barricade ourselves into the room. We had to basically, like, I mean, like the room, it was a library and it just sort of had a few tables and a few chairs. Um, and as always, it wasn't really planned. So we kind of just ran into the room and just had to throw up this, this barricade with whatever was but in there. But you see, oh, I, like, but, I like the idea of us doing that because I think to myself, well, if we get, have a go at filming it and, it and it's rubbish, then it doesn't matter. But in fact, it worked. All I need to we do We made a really good barricade. We made a really good barricade. <laughs> Uh, but we had to be careful that it was easy to take down, obviously, in between takes, if people need to, like, run out for a wee and stuff. <laughs> but um, I remember there being this one take where I think we had one of the tables the wrong way around. We had to try and, like, spin it. We were knocking into each other and stuff. That was really funny. Um, but I'll always, I mean, I'll always I... remember Mark, when, when we had Mark on set, Mark Wingate, um, just, like, blowing the film wide open every time we walked into a room. And there was these scenes where we were in the library when we barricaded the door. And um, not, not to spoil anything, but Mark has this big, it's the end of the world moment. <laughs> I, I remember, exa- well, exactly. I remember me and Tony just a few times just trying not to laugh at some of the things he was saying. He caught me. Standing, he caught me. Yeah. Out, <laughs> yeah he, caught, he caught us off guard so many times. Um, <laughs> yeah. There was a really, I think it was the so reaction. many stories. I could, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the it I mean, was the reaction stories of it for ages. I think I think I think <laughs> I, I think I like the way Tony uh, 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 pronounces Sigourney Weaver. And, Sigourney, and I, love that I knew you was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually, because for once like... I get to be Sigourney. What was it again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it was it. But that that is like for me my favourite line in the movie. That's my, when I was writing that, I literally wet myself because it's three <laughs> o'clock in the morning. And I thought, how can I get Sigour- that line? I want Because obviously Sigourney Weaver in Aliens, right? Mm. Everyone wants to be a character who can battle aliens and win the, win the war. Um, and I thought, can I get this line in? How do I get it in? And I just thought, well, if he just says it. <laughs> and I just remember wetting myself, reading it back, thinking, this is, this, we can't get away with this. We can't. But... <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens with me if i if i get into to, to creating something sometimes i just don't stop and i'll end up just writing and writing and writing and then look at it and it'll either be brilliant like this or it'll be rubbish but um i just remember i mean i think the the, the memories for me are that everyone had so much fun i do remember the day that we had all the zombies and you even oh, had children dressing day. up as zombies and it was great we had about five or six such makeup artists day. and you know, they all just didn't moan. They all just liked being shot and stuff like that. And it was hilarious. And then you had those old people. Who, I thought that was the funniest it's moment. The for me. They, said, <laughs> they said, oh, we can't get down on our knees. Like, literally, they couldn't get down on their knees. And I said, do you need a stunt double? So I said to them. <laughs> and um, you know, what? I said, why don't you shot. stand there? Why don't you stand there? And you two don't bother to shoot held, them. And I thought, well, that's held, hilarious. Held these little <laughs> things, right? And we just ran past them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was a really, really good day, and I think that was that was really good fun as well because again, it it wasn't planned. We just no, we walked into this location, just... had some fantastic rooms, and we just found ways to utilize the different entrances into these rooms. And like well, I just saw, said, we had I old just... people and we had young people, yeah. and it was kind of we could use whatever we wanted to use. We found you know we found funny, really funny things like again with these old people and with the kids and one of the kids like grabbing onto my legs. And one of the older people grabbed And then you shoot him in the head, and, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it, I think, I think fun, some man. of those, some of those sequences weren't planned. But some of them, I had ideas of how we would do it. Although I had this more comical moment, you know, that section where you could go from one room to another. I had this kind of idea that you would go back and forth, and they just follow, 
And I did have a couple of lines there that I originally wrote, which would have been Tony going, look, they just follow, they just follow you. They just follow you like that. And you're going from room to room. But I thought at that stage, you're all, it's all kind of action and, and suspense. Yeah, it would have slowed it down. It would have slowed it right down. Um, but I remember thinking to myself, I think we did 250 different shots on that day, which I think is the most I've ever done in a day. Mm. But, I planned some of them. So I kind of like planned them as sequences, but yeah, most of it was just, we'll have three of you come around the corner and we'll shoot you. Mm. But they all <laughs> felt weirdly or did something different or original. Yeah. And uh, that was, that was, that was fun. It was really fun. And obviously if you're shooting in a, an abandoned building, it's, it's much easier just to, to do stuff and not worry about yeah. the things around you. You know, that was a good thing about it as well that we, we had obviously all of these extras and they were all so, like Steve said, they were so happy just to be there and just to like get covered in blood and fall over. And like we, that when we were just kind of improvising these scenes where we ran around and shot them, it wasn't just you know me and Tony run around a corner and shoot them. They were reacting so well as so yeah. no matter what point, if you just pointed a gun at them, they just fall over. Um, <laughs> so apart from there was this one, there was one take where we came around the corner and it was these two kids ran out. And we, we shot them and they just kind of like really slowly fell on the floor and started laughing. Like mid take, you could just hear these two little girls just like giggling away in the corner. That's in the blooper <laughs> reel, isn't it? They have to find the yeah, blooper yeah, yeah, reel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... That was, that was, that was, that was, was really, actually, no, funny enough, when, I, when we actually sat and watched the film after, I don't even remember it on the day, that many people. But when, the, when they all start coming out of all the doorways, when we run in, Mate, yeah. when I watched it back, I thought, my God, how many people were there on set? I didn't realise there was that many well, people there. That was really what happened. Originally, Originally, we had three days <laughs> or three and a half days or something like that. And I think what happened was originally we didn't have many extras turn up. Do you remember we went out the back and we yeah. filmed yeah. three or four of us chasing you? And then you, Tony fell over. Threw Tony on his ass. And that was the moment when I realised we're going to need an extra day. <laughs> we're going to need a lot of extras and in the end Stacy really helped out because she knew a lot of people and Jake knew a lot of people and loads of local people just came down for the day and we fed them really fed them yeah. well and they had really good makeup all the all the all all of them had their own portraits done by our stills photographer and of course they just had fun as well they really loved it um, and being a supporting artist is very hard very hard to just wait around and do nothing all day yeah. Um, yeah. but they they really loved it so you know and also for us, it's great because when it gets released, they'll all go and buy a copy. <laughs> <laughs> or rent it or Absolutely. whatever. Or, or rip it. Or rip it from the internet for free. I'm sure it's yeah, yeah. real. <laughs> well, the, the reoccurring theme that I keep taking away from this is how much fun that you guys had making this, this film. Because clearly the three of you are very passionate about the world of filmmaking and working in the film industry. So what I'm curious about, and, and Elliot, I, I want to start with you. What was it that initially made you want to become an actor and work in the film industry? Um, good question. I, I think I was always, I've always had like a really uh, wild imagination. And I, you know, when I was a little kid, um, I used to always kind of want to just dress up and run around and kind of go on some kind of adventures. So I, I was always really um, imaginative and creative in that way. And then, you know, just the normal kind of stuff. I did plays when I was in school, um, but I'd never really studied it. <coughs> and so I just kind of decided to go to uni. And when I was at university, I did a history degree um, of all things. And while I was there, I was really lucky. There was a really brilliant um, filmmaking society at my university. And um, I just like, I just kind of chanced my arm. I was like, I'll just, I'll audition for a short film and, and kind of see what happens. And um, you know, the next week I had offers from like five of the films out of about six or seven films. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I can, you know, get a few roles, have a bit of fun, do a little bit of acting and filmmaking and carry on with my degree. And um, just got absolutely hooked and haven't left it alone since. And uh, so, yes, yeah, spent sort of three years at uni studying, but making a lot of films on the side. And then kind of just decided I needed to, to train. So I went, I went to drama school for a year and trained at Mount View. And um, yeah, just been kind of stuck in from there. And, and I graduated and started getting into short films, kind of charged through a lot of short films. And then Stephen got me in for a couple of feature films, which was fantastic. And 
yeah, it's just sort of run from there. Like, I mean, Tony mentioned earlier about having, you know, getting stuff an agent and everything. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of, that's, that's kind of how I got stuck into it really was, it was just sort of, it felt like a natural progression and, um, you know, when I realized you can make it into a career that, that gets you paid, I was, I was kind of all in really. So yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I got stuck into it. What about you, Tony? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I started off as a, as a child performer. Um, I spent some time in the industry, came out and went into work as you do. I was still, as my dad said, when I was 17, you can stop prancing around the theatres now and get a proper job. So <laughs> I went out, got, got another job, started working and then, and then realised that it was, there was something missing in life. You know, it was, I never really enjoyed doing anything else. Acting was always, um, the, the, not just the acting, every aspect of filmmaking interests me. It always has done. Um, and I think coming out of the industry for a while and then coming back again later in life, that's when the independent had hit the market a lot more. It wasn't around so much when I was younger. There was a, a there was a different system when I was younger. You know, you, you couldn't talk to directors. You didn't talk to producers. There was a, a, a hierarchy that you didn't cross a bridge of, you know, years ago. And that's all changed. Um, and coming back uh, when the independent world came out, I suddenly realised that there were so many talented people out there that just passionate about doing what they love doing. It had nothing to do with money. It was nothing to do with fame, fortune, taking a pat on the back. It was about creating something, something that you could now do as individual people. If you've got a camera and you've got the access to the internet, you didn't need the big players anymore. You could come along and take over and you could make something that was really just as good. Um, so for me, it was, it was always, it was always part of me. Um, I don't breathe unless I'm, unless I'm around a film set. I find my oxygen to be starved from my body. I only live and come alive when I'm anything anywhere near a film set. I, I, I can't express, and I've said this a lot of times to people, you sit in a room um, when you're doing a read-through, and, and next time you do it, take a look around that table. Look at all the strange characters that are sitting there. They would never put none of you together. But you're all there for one reason, because you share a dream and a passion that you've all got inside you, and that's what the chemistry connects you. You know, it's, it's that... Um, I don't know. For me, there's just this is it's it's complete life. You know, why not do a job where you can become and be someone else every day of the week, someone different, and really live that life. You know, live it right to the fore of 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 everything, the max of it. His habits, his eating, his his wearing, his family, his life, and then two weeks later, become someone completely different all over again. What a fantastic job! Mm. You, you hit the nail on the head. There's nothing quite like being on a film set. It's almost like you're home. For those who yes. love working in film, you're at home when you're on a film set. And yeah, the, yeah. the cast and crew become extended family because you spend so much time all together. And it's almost yeah. like when, when production wraps, it's like the end of summer camp. It's like, you know, yeah. I want to want to see you guys but, again. But look at the great thing it is. You walk onto a film set. I've, I've walked onto a film set in the States. I've filmed in Barbados. I've filmed all over. doesn't matter where I go. I might not know no one. And there might be, everyone's contracted from someone else. But straight away, you feel at home. You don't feel out of place. You feel as though you've got a connection straight away. And that is the greatest job in the world to have. I mean, there is no other job like it. Paid or not paid, you wouldn't get me not in front of the camera somewhere. I don't care. You know, it's never been about the money for me. It's like I say, it's always been about that, the creative side, the drive um, to entertain people, to bring something, to, to give someone some enjoyment from. Do you know what I mean? This is, uh, and, and you know, it's, you're never going to go anywhere. You know, in a hundred years time, some kid's going to sit at a computer and they're going to look at a film and they're going to go, what a load of crap, but I'm still there. You're never going to get rid of me. I've become immortal overnight. You know, I'm going to be there forever now. I'm never going anywhere. I love that. I, yeah, I had, I had a similar moment when I um, was kind of trying to cross over into the industry where I realized that, especially coming out of university, there was nothing else that I wanted to do. My work ethic for anything else is absolute zero. I have no work ethic for anything else. But the minute I step into a rehearsal room or an audition, just an audition room or uh, on, onto a set, like Tony said, I'll, I'll kind of come alive. That's why I feel like I'm, I'm like myself the most. Um, and I don't, I don't, you know, my friends that I have that aren't actors, I don't know if they feel like that when they step into their workplace. But I, you know I, mean? I don't know if you get that anywhere else. But like you said, that creativity is, is um, it's a buzz. Needing to kind of, exactly, is that I need to feel that urge, feeling that buzz of, of creating something. Also, when you, like Tony said, when you do look around and you see, even if it's only like three, four, five, ten, a hundred people surrounding you 
and everyone's pointing in the same direction and working on the same thing and striving to make one thing to the very best of their ability there's yeah there's, there's nothing like it and everyone's on their own level of excitement to, to get this thing done and I, I think that well, I, I you mean, don't get much else like that I think when I when I was young I mean basically I've always wanted to be telling a story so I think now at the moment I've probably done more than 500 scripts 500 different stories um that I've written at some point in various ways. But when I was younger, I mean, I was given, you know, eight millimeter cameras that had four minute cartridges and you'd splice films together. I mean, they were abysmal, but it was, you know, I think it's a buzz. It is true. It's, it's a drug, you know, it's, it's kind of, you get on set and some, somehow your energy levels are way higher than they were the week before. And you're, you're all, all pulling to do, what is right and try to make the best film possible that creates passion passion sometimes create conflict but conflict isn't bad if it's creative and on small films we tend to and i think with this we'd never i don't think we ever had any conflicts or anything but on other films sometimes you do but creative wise it's because we're all creative and we all want to be there um and I think sometimes on the bigger movies, there are a lot of people who don't want to be there. I'll give you an example. I mean, Tony, Tony <coughs> come and shot a two or three movies that we shot in 2016. I think one of them was Borstal. We did the Howling and there was another one we did. Do you remember, Tony, there was a, we were on this place and this other film, this ITV thing turned up yes. and they were all just totally miserable. <laughs> and they had like 20 cameras of, they had third ADs that were two miles from set, stopping people from getting anywhere near them. Um, and it's just like, well, when you've got a tiny film and you've got a small, it is like a family. Um, and I've learned that. I've learned over the years that you have to have a family. You have to have people who want to be there, who want to give 100% all the time because we have no money to, to be able to create big Marvel superhero movies we're we're telling stories in old-fashioned blue peter you probably won't know what that is but it's kind of like blue peter filmmaking i call it which is basically you're putting things together from nothing and and telling a story in an old-fashioned way i mean um i i, I saw something recently where I, I shared something the other day it was hitchcock and an interview where he'd go off and do stories and tell create stories being in the bleakest pace possible to create this story and he even told a story of going to a place called burnham on sea which is near to me where my sister lives and i thought and his idea more or less came probably for the birds from being in this bleak place so i think so if someone like that has you know he's he, you know d d dealing with having a micro budget it's all about everybody that's involved and you can tell a story and be on there. It's a heartbeat. It's a heartbeat. If you can keep that heartbeat going, and make sure everyone's fed and make sure everyone's got somewhere to sleep and make sure everyone's, every, everyone's kind of like, you know, warm. Um, you get a better, a better film. Um, and my experience I, I, when I was younger was I got on a lot of film sets. I got onto a lot of uh, pine wood. I've been to loads of different places where I've worked. And I just found that they were very boring. Honestly, very, very boring. I went one place, I, I, I was on a, a set for a week working as a production assistant because someone was sick and I was there working out and I don't think I even saw the set. And I thought, well, if this is, is this really, you know, disillusioned me into not wanting to work on major films or big films. The money was great, but where was the creativity? And that is the difference between what we're doing and what these bigger films are doing. We're, we're, we, we're being as creative as we can with what we've got rather than just spending money willy nilly when they don't need to. I just wish we had a fraction, you know, a day's budget from a Marvel <laughs> film. I think me, Tony and Elliot could go and make like a whole 16 series of dead again. <laughs> <laughs> and, dead uh, again, yeah. the web series. Well, exactly. that's where we. That's where it's. That's where it's going now. Is 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 TV? It's internet. It's it's something like that. That's really what you need to do is is try and create stuff that's everlasting. 
Yeah. But someone goes, oh, this is good. I want more. I'll binge watch that. Well, and that, that brings up a great point. Do you guys each individually have um, any upcoming projects you want to talk about or maybe future collaborations between the three of you? Um, so I, I've had a really kind of interesting year, actually. I, a lot has kind of changed for me in the last year. So I, I, I managed to sign to a new agency, which, which was great. Um, and straight away, I mean, I'm kind of been working in, in new spheres, which is cool. Um, I, at the end of last year, I managed to get a sort of small part, um, in an upcoming Marvel film, which I'm not, I'm allowed to talk about it. I think I can't say what it is, but, um, so that's cool. Um, so sorry the Marvel films and then there I am. So so that is was, it that a speaking was... role? Yes. Wow. Nice. Oh wait. That's good. That's it's, awesome. It's, it's, it's small, it's got a small see uh, that that's come off of working with us, you see. <laughs> that's a... <laughs> like, hey, look, I've done a film with Stephen M. Smith, and they're like That's hey, it, you got the job. Yeah. Come up to Pinewood, we'll see you down there. If you've gone through that <laughs> hell, we'll give you anything. <laughs> um, so that, yeah, so that's that's out, I think, either this year or next year, I'm not too sure. Um, and then otherwise, just kind of really trying to stay involved, um, like Tony said, with like kind of independent film circuit. And so I, there's a few films coming up um that i've managed to get some roles in a couple of like kind of proof of concept things to kind of pitch to funding to make bigger films and so on um yeah a couple of short films here and there some tv commercials which is great um just trying to keep on top of stuff as much as i can and kind of keep myself involved and keep the next project rolling so um yeah that's kind of me for now really what about you tony <laughs> um, it's, it's been all right. I've just finished. I've actually just finished directing. A, I'm, I can't say what it is, but I've just finished uh, directing a five-part drama series for Amazon, um, which is was really good. It was really good. It was my it was my biggest directing piece to date. So it was uh, a very interesting piece. Um, I've just been casted on a Netflix uh, series as the lead cop in Underground. So I've got that coming up to look forward to. Um, and I am um, three quarters, I'd say, because of the lockdown of the way through Web Pool, which is a new TV series, where I play, again, one of the uh, funny roles of copper in that. Funny. I seem to get coppers all the time. I don't know what it is about me and coppers. I just can't get away from being a copper. <laughs> the Underground, I play a copper as well. Web Crawler, I play a CID guy. Dead again, I was a copper. I just can't seem to get away from being a copper. I must look like a copper. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun role, though. Being a copper and having all of the gear on and everything is so much fun. When you do put your, when you do put a policeman's uniform on, you you do sort of feel that power of authority. It does make you stiffen up and it and it squares your back up and it makes you feel powerful. So there is an enjoyment, I suppose, in it. You wouldn't think that you put your hand in your vest. And I was kind of naturally, yeah. you know, so you've got this. But yeah. I have no problems. I've been told off a few times now. I have no problems of being on set and stop talk to the public and start directing traffic. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? I've been told off a few times on set that you can't do that. Why? They needed somewhere to park, you know, and they listen to you. It's great. You know? Uh, I've even found that you can go to McDonald's and get a free coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. What about you, Stephen? Um, well, I've just I've just uh, finished a film with Doctor Who and uh, an actor called Julian Sands who was in a room with a view, which is a a ghost film. Uh, I've done a drama doc which is being commissioned for six parts for Channel Five, uh, which is coming up. I've done two parts already, but obviously lockdowns caused issues. I have two a creature feature. I have a buddy cop film. I have quite a lot of stuff. Um, I have about 10 projects on the go. Um, there's five or six of them all with distribution companies waiting to be released. We shot a movie in a couple of movies in lockdown uh, in, a, in a particular way that we were able to. Um, and I think it's, you know, I think the thing is, it's, it's good to hear these guys 
saying that they're progressing and because it sounds like they're progressing as well it's always about trying to take the, the next step even if it's a baby step so it doesn't necessarily need to be bigger budgets it just needs to be you learn from things that you did wrong in the previous film i think one of the things i used to do was cut corners quite a lot and rush things and i think it's all about the planning and the planning process should be a lot better so my i mean my future is quite good i mean i've got um probably four or five films that we're going to shoot in the next 12 months um it really depends on which ones come ready at the time so for example i know that that uh the dead again is now going to be on dvd in walmart around the time that army of the dead which is Zack Snyder's film is coming out. Now the trailer I think got released today and it looks very similar to dead again. So I'm going to contact Zach and say, you know, why are you still in my story? Um, <laughs> but that's really what happens. You, you talk to distribution companies, they go, give me this, give me that. I want that. But they want it yesterday. So by the time you get around to being ready to shoot it, they go, oh, no, I don't want that now. Can you give us this instead? And because of COVID, it's all been up in the air, you know, even James Bond has been delayed almost two years. And I think that there's lots of stuff that's been shot in 2019 that we haven't seen and is going to be seen this year. And almost 2020 is, you know, just been right off for a lot of, a lot of people. So um, I, I say I, I have a project that I shot in 2016. I'm still, I've just literally sold it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm finishing off the edit on that. So it's, it's, that's really what I've been doing. I've been talking to John Cleese about a project uh, that I've got ongoing. Uh, but again, it's very hard because you need five times the budget that you normally have, you know, for if you start to attach names. But that's the future. The future is having names in the films and, you know, and, and but then also still using new talent and people that are good. I sometimes get associated with people and it's a contractual thing where I've ended up having finance put in place. Then I end up having to use two or three of the same actor or same people because they were involved in some of the finance. And that's put me back before. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy that I could see other people progressing around me because um, that means my little stepping stone is good. They've, they've used my, me to, to step up, which is great, or used it to get wherever they need to go which is always what I've wanted to do. I've really, really wanted to kind of really be a film agent, I think, and, and get people to progress them. And Because it's really hard work making films. It's much easier watching other people make them and succeed than it is to actually make them. I'd like, I like, to, uh, I'd like to just make it known as a Derek Diamond Experience exclusive that I would be very on board for a Dead Again too. I'm there for a sequel. If, uh, well, to be honest with you, we could have a very exclusive here because you guys don't know about this, but I actually have written something for you too, Ooh. which I am not going to show you or tell you. <laughs> I have written a full script for you two to be in it. Oh, boy. Together. Breaking so, news. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's not a sequel. Watch this face. It's not a sequel to show. Delegate. It was straight from the horse's mouth on this show. Remember this. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to record this and play it back later. So all I want to know is who wants to be the front end of the of the, of the Pentaman horse? <laughs> <laughs> me, 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 because Elliot likes a lot of curry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, that's awesome. Breaking news! Breaking news here on the show. It's called uh, Pentamime the movie. <laughs> uh, last thing I want to ask you guys before we get out of here, and we'll Stephen, we'll start with you. Uh, do you have any website or social media that you'd like to plug so the listeners can follow you? And how can people watch Dead Again? Okay, so what, D Dead Again, obviously in the states, I think it's on about thirteen platforms, different platforms, um, and it, mainly on Amazon. Um, it will be coming out on DVD, Walmart, and a few other places um, where family video is still around by then. Um, but it will be on in, uh, in sort of, I think it's August, July or August. Um, and yeah, I mean, and obviously worldwide, it's gone worldwide, um, except the UK. We're still trying to finalise a deal in the UK. Um, 
so look out for it we share it there's uh, find me on facebook um there is websites everywhere about me mainly good stuff but there's also bad stuff which is interesting and funny really bad reviews that we get which are really really funny um but yeah um it's that's i would i would look if you want to if you want 75 minutes of escapism then i would suggest you go and watch dead again <laughs> love it uh, Elliot, what about you? Any website or social media you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, you can catch me on Instagram uh, at Elliot Cable, uh, E-L-L-I-O-T-C-A-B-L-E. Um, I'm on Twitter, Elliot underscore Cable. Um, I'm on Spotlight, as most actors are. Again, Elliot Cable. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. Facebook also, if you fancy it. All over the place, really. IMDB, sure. Check me there as well. Tinder, um, Tinder, <laughs> Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, all of it. I'm everywhere. <laughs> um, uh, what about you, Tony? Uh, it's like, like the same as Elliot said, but just uh, please don't type Elliot Cable. Put my name instead. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, now the same thing. I mean, um, Instagram, social media, Twitter. The easiest thing I say to anyone that's trying to follow me or find me, type my name into Google. You'll find me at the top. What's what I can say, you know? I mean, I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, you are saying about people like like different sites, you're all over the place. You know what? I still find that I have fan clubs in like China and Russia. And so you, have you ever typed your name into Google and looked at some of the stuff that's on there? I mean, I have people talk about stuff that I don't know about myself, but they seem to know. I don't know. <laughs> well, we, we, we're talking about that. I mean, I know that Dead Again has definitely been sold to South Korea. And it's probably oh. been dubbed. So <laughs> it is very funny watching our films that are dubbed because they're just hilarious. Um, I would love but to yeah. see a dubbed version. I think that'd be brilliant. A dubbed version. They usually so, just I'm not, I'm not going to South Korea voices. for a holiday now, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go to Seoul. <laughs> There'll be, there's pictures of you two on the wall. What <laughs> is? Have you seen these guys? We need them to, to get rid of this alien invasion. <laughs> but you never know the funny thing is we laugh about this but the f you never know what happens sometimes films do incredibly well in other countries because they get dubbed by people who are really well known and then they're suddenly out there and you're thinking oh well it's number two in the cinema or something i heard this with, with some other filmmaker i know and it's like well but no one else has ever heard of the film flopped everywhere else but suddenly it's amazing in this Taiwan or whatever. I know I know Scare Attraction that both these guys have been in. We've sold that to Taiwan. So that's in Taiwan somewhere. Um <laughs> so been dubbed. Um but yeah it's 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 very it's very kind of interesting to see uh how I didn't say anything about Instagram but these guys did. So I need to get on Instagram. Um, oh, yeah. I know that my sister's cat has more followers than me on Instagram <laughs> which is re really terrifying. Um, and I, I think that maybe I should set up one for my cat um, and see if we can outdo each other. But that's uh, that's it. That's that, that's basically it with me. It's kind of like <laughs> you can find me online, but I'm not top of the list. My company probably is. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show to talk about Dead Again and just your time in the industry. This was fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much for having Thank us. you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Stephen M. Smith, Tony Fadiel, and Elliot Cable for coming on the show. That was an awesome conversation. I had a blast talking with those three guys. Be sure to check out Dead Again and be sure to follow them on Instagram to find out what they'll be up to next. And if you want to follow this show on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at D Diamond Podcast. If you want to subscribe to the show, just search for the Derek Diamond Experience on Apple Podcast. Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts. And I'm also on YouTube. Just search for Derek Diamond if you want to watch the video versions of the show. I'm also on Patreon at patreon.com slash ddiamondpodcast. And of course, thank you to my close friends, the Unicorn Wranglers, for providing the theme music for the podcast. You can check out all their music on Apple Music, Google Play, and Spotify. That's going to do it for this week's show. Enjoy the rest of your week. Have a safe and fun weekend. Thank you for tuning in to another awesome episode of the Derek Diamond Experience. I'm your host, Derek Diamond, and we'll see you guys back here next Thursday.